we can start. So hello everyone. It's a pleasure to introduce today Michele Cantiello, who is a full astronomer, full-time astronomer at uh, the INAF Astronomical Observatory of Abruzzo since 2016. Michele obtained his PhD in 2004 at the University of Salerno in, collaborations, in collaboration with the John Hopkins University in Baltimore on the topic of SPF from HST Imaging. He held then several postdoc and research assistant positions in Italy and the US. His research interests cover the observations and data analysis for resolved and more in particular, and more in particular unresolved stellar populations. He has been part of several photometric and spectroscopic surveys of galaxies and galaxy systems in the nearby universe the Next Generation Virgo Cluster Survey, the Fornax Deep Survey, and the VST Survey of Elliptical Galaxies. He's presently a member of the Maori Science Operation Group and coordinating a working group for a proposal with LSST. Thank you so much, Michele, for accepting your invitation. You may start when you're ready. Okay. Uh, uh... I'd like to thank you all for uh, being here and I'd like to thank Anna for the invitation to present uh, uh, this work and discuss the, this research line that uh, I have uh, um, uh, been doing uh, uh, carrying on with uh, uh, a bunch of collaborators you see listed here and um, as you heard, uh, the topic is about the study of uh, distances using the surface brightness fluctuation method. This is the outline of my presentation. I will first uh, dedicate some time on uh, the importance of measuring distances, then uh, some properties and definitions of the SPF technique, uh, selection, a selected collection of results, uh, future applications, and my conclusion. And I will dedicate some time to the definitions and properties of this technique. That's because um, although this is one of the most powerful distance indicator, one of the most accurate in, in its class, it is uh, also uh, poorly known. I guess it's because of uh, uh, the, maybe it's uh, kind of uh, particular, let's say. And uh, I, I will, that's why I will dedicate some time to that. So uh, why we care about distances? I understand that uh, in your department and uh, all the other uh, colleagues that have joined the, the, this seminar, um, uh, you have a broad interest in astrophysics. And, uh, but in any case, uh, any time that you, uh, well, well, most of the times, not all, in all cases, but in most times you, um, you need to you study some quantity, um, uh, like masses, luminosities, linear sizes, and, and so on and so forth, um, ages, um, you need to know the distance of the target you are interested uh, to study. So, uh, so distance is a, is a key quantity and clearly because of error propagation, the better you know the distance of your target, uh, the better you can constrain the quantity that you're interested in. Now, this is quite kind of basic. I understand there are some undergrad students. So, uh, probably you all know that the, the, the distances in astronomy are organized in uh, what, this is, what is called the, the cosmological distance ladder, in, uh, which means that the closer objects are used to calibrate the, the properties of the farther objects and then so on and so on, uh, going out, out to very large distances until the cosmic flow where the envelope can be used. Um, in the very close uh, regime, we have very accurate, quite accurate uh, uh, determinations based on geometric methods or parallaxes. But when we go to the uh, to larger distances, we need something that uh, is uh, either a standard candle or a standard ruler. I mean, something that has either a constant characteristic or uh, some characteristic that can be calibrated in such a way that uh, we uh, I use that property that we observe, like a luminosity or a size, to determine distances of objects, of a given class of objects. 
So as you might understand very easily, uh, this situation means that uh, as you reach larger and larger distances, and so more and more ranks of these uh, distance scale, uh, distance ladder, you have uh, an increasing uh, uncertainty due to larger and larger um, propagated errors. So the ideal situation would be only a few uh, ladders. So with Gaia, now we can reach distances of the order of kiloparsec with parallaxes. Then there are the primary indicators which are calibrated with something like Gaia. Uh, these are RLIRA, CFINS, uh, TRGP. And then with the primary indicators, we calibrate secondary indicators like the SPF I will talk about, supernovae, global cluster luminosity function, and others. So this, the, the ideal situation is to have many different indicators to cover the whole, uh, no, few indicators, but different of them to cover the whole uh, distance ladder. Now, uh, what is the SPF method? It's a, well, uh, some history. It's a technique introduced in the late 80s by John Torrey and collaborators to derive distances for elliptical galaxies out to 20 megaparsec. Now, it's 30 years that this technique has been applied, and they now use it for a much wider class of objects, not only ellipticals, but also bulged spirals, peculiar galaxies, CDs, with a wide range of masses also reaching very large distances of the order of 100 megaparsec and more today with typical errors be, that can be below 5%. So this is a cartoon again showing the distance scale uh, ladder with different primary, secondary, and geometric uh, distance indicators. And I want to highlight again this particular property of the SPF technique, which is the fact that you can use this. It's one of the distance indicators that covers the largest fraction, uh, a very large fraction of um, uh, the distance, uh, um, as cosmological, dist uh, cosmological distance from, again, few megaparsec, megaparsec out to 100 or two. How this technique works. So the idea qualitatively is, is very simple. So here you see the images of two galaxies. One, it's relatively close. It's less than one megaparsec. The other one is much farther away at 100 megaparsec. You see that the sides of the two objects appear quite similar, they are both spheroidal, both uh, they have this elongated, but you can easily re recognize that in one case, the upper, I, you, I guess you see my pointer, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, in one case, uh, uh, the luminosity, the brightness profile of the galaxy has a lot of granulosity. I checked on the Portuguese, and it's granula sao probably. Uh, yes. I don't know if it's the real word. <laughs> while the, the lower um, galaxy is much smoother. So if you identify a way to measure the granulosity, you have a quantity that correlates with distance. More granulosity, uh, closer, low granulosity, farther away. To be a big more uh, quantitative, but it's not yet the, the end of the game. So let's say we have a, um, a, st um, a star field, um, a, a field of stars characterized by some mean flux f and the stellar density n and at a distance d. If we place the same stellar field three times more distant, we get that the flux, which scale, scales with the inverse square of the distance, goes to f bar over 9. And the stellar density goes to 9 times n because the, stellar, the density goes with the square direct square of the distance. Now, uh, we convolve this with the water, the CCD sees, and we get this very easy result, which is known in extragalactic astronomy, that by multiplying these two, these two quantities, you get the surface brightness, and the surface brightness is identical for the two populations. That's well known that surface brightness, at least very first approximation, doesn't depend on distance. What happens when? Here, we added more pixels and we check, we look at the, the uh, fluctuations of the, between the close pixels because of the uh, change of the stellar 
uh, counts. This is a Poissonian experiment, so the, the, the number of, of uh, stars ch uh, changes with the square root of n. So in one case, the flux fluctuation is square root of n times f. In the second case, it's the same thing, but over three. So the surface brightness is constant with distance, but the surface brightness fluctuation depends, depends on the distance, which is basically what I said, the fact that closer objects appear more granulous, farther objects appear smoother. Uh, now we convolve this with the atmosphere and normalize to the, to the, uh, the mean flux, and we get something which is very close to what is the, the um, surface brightness fluctuation by definition. So to go finally in the definition of this uh, quantity, uh, Tony Schneider in 1988 and then Tony collaborators in the 90s uh, introduced the, the SPF as the ratio of the second to the first moment of the stellar luminosity function in the object. So now, given the definition, we need a way to measure fluctuations. Once the, 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 the quantity is calibrated, then it, it follows the distance modulus in the usual way from where you can get the distance to the target. That's the very common in all uh, standard candles. How do we measure uh, surface brightness uh, fluctuations? Uh, well, this is uh, the image of a bright elliptical. You derive the model of the galaxy, which if you think about it, is the first moment uh, of the luminosity function. Then you get the residual frame, which is, again, something related to the variance. And then this gets normalized to the mean flux. Well, there is a square in between, but by the way, this is the, let's say, this is the uh, fluctuation frame, this one you see here. Clearly, you recognize immediately that there is something wrong, because here we do not only see the fluctuations due to stars in the galaxy, which are the pixel to pixel fluctuation. We also see these bright objects, which are background galaxies, foreground star, stars, and the most dangerous part are these bright knots, which I hope you see, which are the global clusters in the galaxy. Uh, these sources clearly generate an, odd, uh, an extra fluctuation, and we mask them out. After masking, we have uh, the uh, residual, let's say, the, what could be considered the SBF frame. Clearly, again, uh, the, the image is convolved with the PSF. So the pixel to pixel fluctuations are correlated by the PSF. So, but he wanted this, uh, so by simply going to the, uh, extracting the power spectrum of the of this image, we can get the amplitude of fluctuations. So we, by matching the power spectrum of this residual image to the power spectrum of a PSF, we get this quantity P sub zero, which is the SPF amplitude. So this might be, uh, might look like at the end of the game, but here uh, there is a, an important step, which I, I would like you to, to, you know, to keep in your mind because it's very important for the, for the SPF determination. So what is shown in this plot uh, is the with the red dot with the sorry with the green dots you see the observed luminosity function of all the sources that we have masked in the previous frame. Uh, you see that the luminosity function ra raises up to magnitude 25 and then has a quick drop uh, after that magnitude that fainter magnitude. That depends on the completeness limit of our frame. This uh, luminosity function is has two components depends on the presence of global clusters, the bright knots, which I mentioned, and this function has a Gaussian sh shape, um, which is the red curve that you see here. And together with that, we have a component of uh, background galaxies, which are shown with the blue line. So by summing up these two, we have what is a, what should be the expected luminosity function. We have a in fact, we have uh, an increasing number of objects at fainter magnitudes. These objects are not seen, so we have not masked them, but they still contribute to the fluctuations, uh, even with some photons. 
So we need to estimate the residual term, this P sub bar of, of fluctuations due to these uh, objects which are beyond our detection limit. Now, if our uh, completeness limit, as in the case shown here, is fainter than the peak of the globular cluster luminosity function, this means that the correction P sub bar is small, uh, a few percent of P sub zero. So this extrapolation that we do here to estimate P sub bar is, uh, does not in, imply a big error. On the contrary, when we have a brighter uh, limit on the completeness, like brighter than the turnover magnitude, this P sub bar starts to become uh, dominant with respect to P sub zero, and then we cannot measure distances. So basically, the quality of the SBF measurement, oh, I'm late, <laughs> uh, depends on the, um, the quality of the measurements, it depends strongly on the quality of on how we can characterize uh, the global cluster population. So then we need the calibration uh, and um, uh, to to compare uh, to be compared with the uh, uh, with the apparent SPF magnitude and on, and then we derive derive a distance. The most reliable calibrations come from uh, observ uh, from um, observational campaign. One of the most important ones was carried out by Tony collaborators in 2000. As you see, the M bar, the SPF magnitude in galaxies in, uh, in uh, well-defined groups correlates quite clearly with, uh, with the, the, the color of the galaxy. And that's because uh, the SPF depends on the properties of the stellar population in there. So uh, by in this uh, com observational campaign, Torian collaborators obtained this calibration fixed on, the, on CFIDs for which uh, you can measure the uh, the integrated color of the galaxy and uh, then get the absolute SPF. Once you have the absolute SPF, you put it here, you have measured the SPF magnitude, you get the distance modulus, and then so the game of the distance is completed. There are various empirical calibrations in different pass bands, sorry, uh, derived by the various authors. Again, the calibration we trust more are the empirical ones, but what is interesting is that we know quite well the definition of SPF. So by using simply uh, stellar population models like uh, isochron models or numerical synthesis techniques, we can obtain theoretical calibration of the SPF magnitudes. The good of uh, having um, um, theoretical calibration is that you have all pass bands you, knew in, uh, you want in a single shot. And uh, conceptually, the SPF method in this way is a primary distance indicator. The bad is that clearly this depends uh, on how good are your models. And besides, different models have more than or, or the order of zero point magnitude difference between each other, which means that uh, we still prefer the empirical calibration for which the error budget is uh, what I reported here. Um, well, maybe I'm going too, uh, too fast. <laughs> It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, as you see here, um, the uh, error, the, the main source of error, um, which I mean, is, is uh, the systematic uh, error, which is basically the tie of uh, uh, the SPF calibration to the distance of CFIDs. Uh, since it's a systematic error, it means, basically means that it's a solid shift of the calibration e equation. And it is of the order of, of 0 0.1 magnitudes. Then we also have uh, an intrinsic scatter of uh, distances, uh, sorry, of the, of the SPF magnitude, which is of the order of 0 0.1 magnitude, but this depends on the pass band. For example, in the I band, this scatter is of the order of, can be as small as 0 0.06 magnitudes. Many of the other this, um, sources of error are typically negligible with respect to this. 
and depending on the observation on clearly depending on the observational setup uh, your observations and uh, uh, this number can be uh, small or or large depending on the situation but in general the two dominating errors are these two ones the intrinsic scatter and the zero point uncertainty so by combining them we can get distances of the order of 10 percent or better actually in the best cases which we i'll show you some examples later we have reached a distance out to, uh, um, an, with an accuracy of six percent or so so uh, a short collection so this was the description part of the technique a short collection of uh, results mostly distances then uh, some uh, words on h naught and uh, uh, stellar populations what we can do with the spf and stellar population so this slide is more uh, an, an historical slide only to acknowledge the fact that uh, the survey uh, by tonian collaborators in 2000 uh, derived the first large sample of SPF magnitudes for and then distances for about 300 objects. And then these two surveys with ACS camera on board of HST of Virgo and Fornax derived about 150 distances with SPF. Then we derived also um, uh, further 250 measurements. I mean, this is only to say that to date, to date, we have about 800 measurements of distances based on this distance indicator. Probably if we count uh, the, the overlapping objects, the number of independent distances we have is of the order of 600. This is important when I will come back to, I will come back to this when I'll talk on uh, LSST. Uh, there, have, there are many studies which have used the SPF, uh, uh, as, as I said, um, this is the typical target uh, for SPF are bright elliptical galaxies. So most of the studies that to work, for example, that they are interested for um, two uh, supermassive black holes in the local volume use SPF distances. Here I report only three very recent um, cases which have been very important for astronomy uh, and they also have covered uh, the media uh have been covered by the media because of their you know uh, of their importance so the first case is ngc 4993 you know this is the galaxy where the first gravitational wave event with electromagnetic observation happened um there was a paper on no several papers on nature and the distance to this galaxy uh well was not very very well constrained until we got uh, spf distance to it and it actually uh, most of the works that use uh, that um, now are published on this interesting event use the, this, the SPF distance, which we derived again using HST data. Then there is this other case, this galaxy NGC 1052 DF2, uh, which is uh, supposedly dark matter free. Now, I, without entering into the debate uh, or whether or not the galaxy is that matter free, because this is not my field of expertise, uh, we were asked to derive the distance to the object. And the, the distance is very important because there is kind of a fight between two, two groups. One group says that the distance is closer, which means that uh, there is not really an issue with dark matter. And the other group says that the distance is about 20 megaparsec. By using SPF, we derive something of the order of 20 megaparsec. And uh, this was also then later uh, uh, confirmed by using other uh, um, distance indicators uh, uh, like the TRGB. And then the third case of this image, I'm sure that you have seen a lot of time, a uh, lot of times. This is the first image of the so-called image of a supermassive black hole in the core of M87 by DHT collaboration. Uh, clearly, the distance to the target is very important, both because of the size and of the mass. And uh, the distance adopted by the collaboration uh, is the mean of three uh, in, in different estimates. Uh, one is the TRGB estimate, which is also the one with the largest uncertainty. And the other two distances are SPF distances by our team. Uh, about H naught, since uh, again the, the, this distance indicator is capable of reaching um, 
quite large distances, uh, it uh, can tell you something about H naught. And, uh, and in fact, there were few, there's, I mean, uh, several estimates in the, in the history of this method. I want to highlight only this last one from uh, Ketan et al, which is a uh, submitted. Uh, I think they, also, they already have the, the referee report, which is kind of mild. And uh, note that the H0 value that they get is something that is close to 79, which is basically in the middle of the, you know, uh, H0 crisis between Planck and, uh, and the direct distances based on supernovae. Uh, the one other thing I want to say is about the fact that uh, um, in addition to distances, because of the definition of this distance indicator, uh, again, the, the amplitude of fluctuation is, the, is defined as the ratio of the second to the first moment of the stellar luminosity function. Now, if you're not interested to distances, but you are interested into the properties of the luminosity function, you can use the indicator all the way around. And so characterize the stellar population rather than measuring a distance. Clearly, um, in this case, I mean, you can you can apply it, uh, for example, very easily if you have SPF gradients, like the internal variation or SPF colors. In that case, you don't need distances. And there are a few studies. This is uh, a study carried out with uh, with um, with the advanced camera for service. But uh, I would like to uh, comment on this this view graph more. Uh, this is a. Uh, the gray lines, you shade and the lines here are the uh, empirical calibrations. And the, mod, the, the symbols here show the position of models. And the different models here, uh, the, uh, the ch what is changing is the efficiency of mass loss at some, at some uh, during the AGB phase. You see that a very specific um, uh, stellar evolution parameter can be kind of uh, calibrated using this distance indicator. I mean, this this quantity. Uh, but uh, well, what I would like to uh, say uh, with the more detail is the capability of this uh, indicator to lift the so-called age metallicity degeneracy. Um, I think that you have heard about it. It's uh, the fact that some uh, indicators, uh, especially for unresolved stellar populations, are degenerated in the sense that if you put here, so these are models, the different colors refer to different metallicities and different sizes to different ages. So basically, uh, models, uh, older ages and uh, higher metallicity uh, go in the same direction, meaning that if you put an observational data on this panel, you basically uh, end up with the uh, large de degeneracy and the galaxy or the population you're studying can basically host any kind of population. This is what happens when you do SPF colors. The model, the models split up very nicely, and you can by if you put over this diagram some observational data, you can get clearly uh, much better constraints on the properties of the stellar population. But uh, what I want to highlight here is the fact that you see this diagram here is i minus k, v minus k. There are not many observations in the, in v band for SPF, and even worse, there is no observation in SPF in the u band. And this is again something that leads me to the next slide, which is the future of this uh, technique. And uh, the future related to, uh, basically, I, I, I will go more in detail on the variable observatory and the ELT, but there are also other facilities. I suppose you all have heard about or know very well, <laughs> depending on your field, about the, the LSST, now called the Verobin Observatory, which is a, um, a survey telescope that soon uh, will start uh, operations uh, uh, in Chile, soon, uh, meaning uh, a couple of years. One of the science cases of this uh, uh, telescope, uh, one of the hundreds of science cases, actually, uh, are the SPF uh, uh, measurement? Is it the SPF measurement? This telescope is going to survey. I, I presume. I mean, if you don't know, uh, the the entire southern skies every every few nights. 
And this is an image of a galaxy, how should be seen um, by the LSST. I suppose you see here the bumpiness of the image. So we expect that the SPF signal is going to be very strong in this, uh, in this uh, with the observations of these facilities. So uh, again, the survey will observe the whole southern skies um, for 10 years. So by the end of the survey, there will be this, uh, this image uh, quads that will be extremely deep. Now, uh, the exact uh, observing strategy is not yet uh, de defined. Uh, the, the cadence of the survey uh, is still argument of discussion. But I mean, here I've taken some numbers, even this 15 seconds per visit is now changing. But, uh, by taking these numbers, which I mean, the, the real numbers won't be anyway too much different. This is what uh, is the number of visits that uh, are predicted for all fields in all bands. And then by simply multiplying these two quantities, you get the total exposure time. And by applying some, some formulas, you get what is the depth that you expect to reach. So you see that, uh, first of all, we will be able probably to measure SPF in new band. Of, although it would be only for closest objects and then many other bands. And uh, it will be probably feasible to measure distances to objects uh, uh, as far as 100 megaparsec. Clearly this will probably only be for the brightest galaxies, but for anything fainter, uh, this pass bands, um, then uh, depending on the pass band and depending on the distance of the galaxy will be possibly uh, we'll measure a uh, signal to noise high enough to, to characterize the distance. So we, with LSST, we both will have SPF colors. So um, a map of the stellar population properties in, in the galaxies that will allow to measure SPF in the blue bands, for example, UNG. But the other thing is that probably we will reach uh, a number of targets with high enough signal to nose, which is very large, probably larger than 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, hundreds and thousands of galaxies, which will have probably high enough signal to noise to measure their distance. This means that uh, with this distance indicator, we will have the most accurate map, three dimensional map of the southern sky of objects out to 100 megaparsec, but again, this limit is probably only for the brightest objects. But recently, for example, with a much smaller telescope, uh, I, I, I think I don't say, I haven't said that the LST is an eight, eight meter telescope, but we, for example, with the Canada France away CFHT telescope, we measured the SPF for objects uh, in Virgo and um, uh, the, the, we had, like 300 measurements again in a very in a tiny fraction of the sky compared to LSST. So this is going to be a great chance because it's a great opportunity to have this accurate map, but also a big challenge because we uh, we have not ready we are not yet yet prepared to so many targets for doing these measurements. What about uh, then the ELT. So LSST is uh, the Vero band observatory is going to be wide and to measure distances from thousands and thousands of objects in the southern sky. What can we do with the extremely large telescope? The two main issues, as I said, are um, in measuring SPF are the completeness limit, and we expect. So we know that with an eight meter telescope with VLT, we have reached eight megaparsec. Uh, and um, the other characteristic required characteristic for SPF is the resolution. So telescope size and uh, PSF resolution. And uh, with the HST, which has a 0.1 arc seconds resolution, we reach the distance of the order 125 megaparsec. Now, by combining the much larger size compared to uh, VLT and a resolution which is even better than the HST, what is the maximum distance that will be feasible with ELT? Well, there are simulations going on. Clearly, we know what are the issues with adaptive optics as such, and these are the PSF stability, the, the size of the field of view, 
the num the huge overheads because of the mm, mm, strategy which is required. It's a non-off strategy, which means that uh, the exposure the the, the overheads are can be very large, typically even larger than five times the exposure time. Other minor problems like photometric calibration, the changes partial scale. By the way. We already have carried out some tests using GEMS at Gemini. Uh, this is a work led by Joe Jens and John Blake's, and John Blake's Lee. And uh, on this galaxy in the normal clusters with barely more, uh, a bit more than um, uh, 20 minutes of exposure, this is the galaxy. Uh, this is a zoom on, on the galaxy with a logarithmic uh, stretch. And this is the residual frame. Probably you already see the bumpiness at the, close to the galaxy core. And this is the power spectrum. As you see, the fluctuations are there. So in spite of the difficulties of measuring SPF uh, in, uh, with adaptive optics, uh, this is feasible. So what are the perspectives? Yeah, the perspectives, we, with, the, with, the, with HST or presently a 10 meter class telescope, we have reached the, the limit of 125 megaparsec. Probably this can be pushed to 200 megaparsec with a bit more uh, work and telescope time. And uh, this is a, the Hubble diagram. And so this is what we can do now, um, re reaching a zero, the redshift 0 0.05 means that we won't really go in, the, in a place where for example, we can recognize uh, different cosmological models. But with ELT, with five times better resolution, probably in the best situation, and the 40 meter aperture with higher deficiency in detectors and the near infrared observations, uh, well, we speculate would it be possible to reach five times, 10 times larger distances? If so, this means that we could get distances in this regime. Well, in, so in the regime where the cosmological models, uh, uh, we, you can uh, constrain different cosmological models. And clearly the situation here with SPF is not like supernova. Supernova are a kind of a random events. They, appear, they uh, take place wherever they want at the time they want, uh, but here, in, with this technique, we can choose the, the target. And so uh, with the ELT and telescope like that, that would be the, the, a, a pencil beam survey uh, with uh, some uh, specific targeted uh, objects and uh, uh, cosmological constraints will be come out uh, um, like this. Um, to be honest, uh, probably the key facility in the next future for uh, for SPF is the James Webb. Um, it's a telescope that has a slightly better, I mean, at least in the near infrared, slightly better resolution than HST, much larger aperture. So uh, it won't have the problems that ELT has. I mean, that adaptive optic, optic has, because uh, there is no uh, atmospheric turbulence, there is no, uh on and off strategy i guess <laughs> uh so it's going to be a much simpler uh, instrument for spf and in fact i think that this is will be james webb will be the, the instrument for spf uh, um, in the next future uh, although i presume that because of its characteristic it will not allow to go as deep as elt and then there are euclid uh, there's Euclid, which is, uh, I mean, is a satellite that is going to be, yeah, I guess you know about it, is going to be launched soon. Uh, it's a small telescope, but because, uh, uh, so, but it has a near infrared instrument that probably won't be, uh, you know, the facility for SBF. But since it's going to get a uh, wide field, oh, sorry, large survey covering probably 15,000 degrees. Uh, or sky, uh, some parts uh, uh, matching LSST, but some others not. It will be probably interesting to uh, uh, an interesting tool to characterize some of the brightest galaxies in, let's say, the local universe. How local we don't know yet. And then there is the Roman Telescope, which will come even later. 
previously known as W first, this telescope has uh, the same aperture of HST, so good um, good PSF sampling, um, and it will have a wide field imager. So it probably will be also this instrument will also be interesting for 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 SPF. And this brings me to my last slide, uh, which since I have a couple of minutes, I will go through it. I would summarize my conclusion and say that this distance indicator is a kind of an interesting, one of the most interesting in its range because of the coverage from few to hundred of megaparsecond, probably in the next future, this number can be doubled or, or more. It, it can be applied to a very wide family of objects, going from globular clusters, actually, to giant elliptical, spiral, spirals, and also morphologically disturbed objects. The intrinsic error can be as small as 5%, and taking into account 0 0.0 uncertainty, smaller than 10% anyways. The origin of the signal is well understood. Uh, uh, it's also a possible tool to study stellar population. There are lots of opportunity, both from ground and space in the future. And the other thing, which is not, uh, uh, I like it anyway, uh, is the fact that uh, with the same data set that you measure SPF, you can get a lot of science out of it, like global clusters, which is a, a science topic of interest of this department, I understand. And uh, one comment from Wendy Friedman in 2012, more people should work on SPF. And uh, so this is my last comment. Feel free to contact us uh, if you're interested in new collaborations. Thanks. Thank you very much for your talk, Michele. For the people following the talk on YouTube, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, please post them in the YouTube channel and uh, Michele will answer them later. Later.